All right, so good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the last lecture of Automata, Computability and Complexity. Week 8, today we talk about car productions. But before we begin, quick check. Can you hear me? Can you see me? It should be all good according to everything I can see, but let's just make sure. Quick answer from Quirky there. Yes, and also Alex and user. Thank you very much. Good, all right. Then we can get started. All right. So as I said, the last week, uh, normally you would have had the exam two weeks from now, but as you should have already seen on Brightspace, um, this is not going to happen. So let me actually go there first. So we have decided to postpone the exam to quarter four. Now, this is not a decision we made lightly. Um, we are aware this is not an ideal circumstance and that some of you may have preferred an alternative solution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is, in our opinion, the best solution at the moment. We need to make sure we still give or that the credits we give uh, are still worth the right amount. And for that, we need a little bit more than just one and a half weeks uh, to prepare an online version of the exam. Because in quarter four, there is a small, 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 tiny chance that it would be possible to do something on campus. Likely it will still be online, uh, but Matthijs and I will need a little bit more time to prepare that for you. Now, as you saw in the uh, announcement in the general CSE bachelor page, um, this exam will not take place before week 4.6. Uh, if it does take place in week 4.6, we will, of course, let you know as soon as we know. Um, I can imagine there's questions about it. I see Lightning already posted one. I'll get to those in a second. Let me just uh, finish up some other things first. Um, about the midterm, we're working very hard at gr on grading, especially during the lab hours. The TAs are available because you seem to have more questions about CPL than about our course. Um, so we're working hard on that and uh, we will hopefully have the results soon, but unfortunately not yet. And uh, now I'll get to any questions that you have. So Idecker, thanks for the reminder, but there's a massive note in front of me here that also says hit the record button and I made sure to hit the record button, but thanks for the reminder. Um, for lighting, um, is it possible that the exam will be held after week 4.11 in July or August? This is not our plan. So our plan is to have it in quarter four and have the reset in quarter five. So the reset will be in July or August. Um, but as far as, our, as far as we can tell right now, we plan to have the exam in quarter four. So that would be at the latest in week 4.11. But yeah, these plans, of course, can, can change as the situation develops, right? But our plan is to have it in quarter four. Did that answer the question, uh, Lighting? Meanwhile, if other people have questions about the exams or anything else related to the course, please do ask them. That's uh, what these first few minutes are reserved for. Good, Lighting. Good to hear that your question has been, uh, has been answered. I see no other questions yet, but I'll give you a couple more seconds to type one in if you have one. If you don't have a question, then please join us in Feedback Fruits. We are using Feedback Fruits 2.0 today. I figured for our last lecture, we can still try one more new thing. Now that we're already trying many new things these, uh, this period, might as well give uh, Feedback Fruits 2.0 a go. Uh, so what about the project in Q4 then, asks uh, Watsi. Uh, will it be at the same time as the exam? Uh, so obviously we are aware that many of you will be doing the software project or even the research project in the next quarter or the old bachelor end project. Um, we will of course keep this into account, right? We're not gonna pick a random date and say, this is it, good luck with whatever else you may have planned. Uh, we will of course confer with the other courses to see what is and is not feasible. So we will get, create an exam schedule that should work for most of you. Uh, ik ben altijd wakker. Initial thoughts on how the midterm has been made up until you guys have graded. Uh, sorry, even in normal circumstances, it would be my policy to only discuss exam results after I have them. Uh, 
uh, and at the moment I don't have them yet. So uh, I'm not going to answer that question yet, uh, if you don't mind, ik ben altijd wakker. Uh, as for class vaak, uh, is AD still two separate exams or is this unknown yet? So this is about algorithm design, another course I am teaching. Uh, we don't know yet. So I have uh, an appointment with Matthijs to talk about this soon. And as soon as we have plans, we will let you know. Uh, but at the moment, I, I don't know yet. Uh, Watsi, did I also answer your question? I see more people have joined feedback fruits. That's good news. Excellent, let's see. And class vaak, I guess I answered your question, or I hope I answered your question too. If so, and I see no new ones popping up, then we can get started with today's content. Yes, all right, excellent, good. Then let's get started. So, in the course, you've seen a lot, all kinds of different languages. Last week, we talked about complexity of problems, and we saw some different complexity classes. P, NP, NP hard, NP complete, all this kind of stuff. I introduced to you the notation or the notion of a car production. Today we will do uh, or we will see two car productions. We will apply them on some instances of problems. We will analyze them. We will uh, look at their proofs, uh, stuff like this. And then somewhere in the future, there's going to be an exam for this course in some form or another. Now, let's quickly recap what we talked about last week while I also ask you some questions about it to see if you got it. So, last week, we talked about these complexity classes. P, NP, NP complete, NP hardness. And I told you that this P and NP, the, that we are not sure whether they are equal or not. So there's two different landscapes that are possible, if you will. Uh, they're uh, drawn here. I've taken this image from Wikipedia. Uh, on the left, we have the uh, case where P does not equal NP. And so P and NP complete are really two separate things. On the right, we have the situation where P does equal NP. And Wikipedia argues that in that case, P is also, yeah, for what, whatever roughly equal means in this context, roughly equal to NP complete. Well, there's a small mistake in that, and we'll discuss that in a moment. First, quickly back to our formal definitions of P and NP. P was all the problems we could solve in polynomial time. And NP was all the problems we could solve in non-deterministic polynomial time, or a better way to think about it, all the problems we could verify in polynomial time. So if you give me a solution, I can check the solution in polynomial time. Whereas for problems in P, I can find the solution in polynomial time. So it's really the difference between finding and checking. Now, with that in mind, here is my first quick fire question for you. So suppose I have a decision problem that is in NP minus P, which of the following are true? So there could be more than one correct answer here. And that's why today we are using Feedback Fruits 2.0, which should allow you to give me anywhere between zero and four answers. It should also have a time limit in it, so I don't have to keep track of that myself. We'll see whether this all works or not. You should have about two minutes now to answer this question.
All right, and apparently feedback fruits auto closes and then shows the results. So I'm not sure how to interpret this for answers with more than one questions with one more than one correct answer because these percentages do seem to add up to a hundred exactly, which is weird if you should be able to select more than one. Um, but anyway, let's take a look at them. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Answer A. A does not have a polynomial algorithm. Yeah, why is that true? Well, if it does have a polynomial algorithm, it would be in P. Right? That's the very definition of, of the class P. So uh, if it does not have one, then it must indeed be in NP minus P. Or if it has one, it should be in P. Uh, but if it's in NP minus P, then indeed it does not have a polynomial algorithm. So answer A is indeed correct. What about answer B? Every yes instance X of A can be verified in polynomial time. Let us think about that. Well, that was the very definition of NP, right? Given a solution, so for a yes instance where a solution exists, given a solution, I can indeed verify that solution in polynomial time. That's the definition of NP. And for problems in NP minus P, they're still in NP, so this must be true. Yes, this answer is also correct. Answer C is a little bit tricky. Um, uh, if every instance can be decided in polynomial time, well, no. It can be decided in non-deterministic polynomial time. But in regular polynomial time, whatever regular may mean here, um, just time as you and I observe it, let's say it like that, uh, this answer is indeed false, as many of you seem to have uh, gone for. Um, I see a question from Jonathan uh, about the first option. If it, ha it still has a polynomial algorithm if p equals np, right? Well, let's think about that. If p equals np, then can our problem a exist? I mean, it should be in np, but not in p. So if p and np are equal, then a doesn't exist, right? So by saying that there is a problem in np minus p, we are implicitly saying p does not equal np. So the situation you, you give, uh, the situation where p would equal np, is impossible assuming that this problem a exists. And therefore answer a is still correct. Good. Okay. Then on to answer d for finally. There is an algorithm A and a polynomial P such that every instance X of A can be solved in O to the power O of 2 to the power the polynomial of X time. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can solve it in some amount of exponential time, is basically what we're saying here. And this, this is true. We did not talk about this a lot last week, but the class NP is a subset of the class exp. And x is everything we can solve in exponential time. A way to think about it is that we did see that anything that a non-deterministic machine can solve, we can transform to something a deterministic machine can solve by introducing exponential overhead, right? Going from a non-deterministic Turing machine to a, to a deterministic Turing machine introduced exponential overhead. And that's basically what we see here, right? A problem in NP can be solved in polynomial time there, meaning in some amount of exponential time, we can construct a deterministic machine to solve it. So answer D is also correct. So the only incorrect answer here is answer C. Um, now there's a very good question from user 9873. Should we assume P does not equal NP when answering questions that don't specify it? Um, as Jana is also pointing out in chat, yes, indeed. Uh, unless otherwise specified, you should assume P does not equal NP. And to make sure our exams are future proof, the cover of all of our exams will always include the sentence for every question where it, unless otherwise specified, assume P does not equal NP. So that even if someday someone would prove that P does equal NP, our exams are still valid. So yes, if uh, unless otherwise specified, uh, we assume P does not equal NP. In this question specifically, because we say assume there is a problem that is in NP minus P, that is the reason why we are assuming P does not equal NP, 
right? This problem can only exist when P does not equal MP. Okay, I see no other questions about this one. So uh, let's move on. We also talked a little bit about car productions last week, or rather I introduced them. So the idea of a car production was that we would find a polynomial function, polynomial time function that would take an input of a problem A, do some magic and transform it into an input for problem B. What would that mean? Well, if we can solve B in polynomial time, then we can now also solve A in polynomial time. And this only works if our reduction is in polynomial time and it maps yes instances of A to yes instances of B and no instances of A to no instances of B. Now, there were some properties that we've proven last week, or we've proven, proved, well, one of the two, it remains a difficult verb, um, that we showed last week. Um, so if x is reducible to y, then if y is in p, x must be in p. If y is in np, x must be in np. Um, and the other way around, if x is np hard, then y must be np hard. Now np hard, what was that again? Well, np hard um, was this. A problem is np hard if and only if for all problems in np, they can be reduced to this problem. So for every problem in MP, there is a reduction to our problem A. And then we had MP complete, which had two requirements. The problem should be in NP. So the solution can be verified in polynomial time. And it should be NP hard. And this class of NP complete problems, we described as the hardest problems in NP. Because solving one of them in polynomial time would allow us to solve any of them in polynomial time. In fact, that is the homework that I gave you, this question to think about. Now, let's see if we can write down the proof for this statement a little bit, or the consequences of this in a little bit more detail. For that, I will be setting up my tablet. So give me five seconds here. I'll mute my mic to avoid the weird noises. If you haven't considered writing down a more formal analysis of this yet, you can take these 20 seconds to do that. All right, there we go. So, move it out of the way. I need a white marker. Here we go. So, let's say I find a problem. Uh, did I already give the problem a name on my slide? Because then I should stick to it. Yes. So, let's say we find a problem X that is an element of P intersected with NPC meaning we have found a problem in NPC that is also solvable in polynomial time. What does this mean? Well, it means that we can now prove um, that P equals NP. So as soon as we found one of these problems, we can show that P equals NP. How do I do that? Well, take an arbitrary uh, problem, let's call it A, that is an element of NP. What do I want to show? I want to show that A is also an element of P, because that would prove that NP is a subset of P. We already know that P is a subset of NP. Combine these and we get to the conclusion that P and NP must be equal. So take an arbitrary problem in NP. We need one to prove it's in P. Well, what do I know? A is reducible to X because X 
is in and oh that is a unfortunate thing this app tends to do sometimes here we go a is reducible to x because x is in uh, mp complete and therefore x is in np hard and remember when a problem was np hard any problem in np would be reducible to it which includes our problem a that is in np but or but well and whatever as x is in p and p is downwards closed it follows that a is in np so np well okay the reasoning and logic teacher inside me says that i should now say since a was arbitrarily chosen yada 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 it follows that np is a subset of p combined with p being a subset of np this shows that p equals np right so finding us this one problem in the intersection of p and npc allows us to show i see that the bottom line of my tablet isn't visible to you let's see if i can fix that there we go yes no maybe hang on if i do this that should fix it yes we're getting there i think it should now be uh this is all i wrote down on my tablet so this should be it okay it was only the conclusion of the proof anyway got your point in reasoning and logic but not anymore nowadays um so yes finding just this one problem that is in np complete that is also solvable in polynomial time would allow us immediately to say okay p and np must be equal the reverse well the reverse is is a is a vague term to use but finding one problem in np complete and showing it is not in p is enough to show that p does not equal np why is that well at that point i found a problem that is in np because it's np complete but i've also shown it's not in p so there must be a difference between p and np and they must not be equal so to show that p and np are equal or to show that p and np are different we can focus on a single problem that is np complete and show either that it is in p or that it is not in p and we would be done of course so far no one has succeeded but that is all it would take right for just one problem that is np complete show it is in p to show that p equals np or show it is not in p to show that p and np are different all right as i get my keyboard back here we will transition back to the slides now someone asked uh, does this also prove that p equals npc um, that's a very good question and that's something I want to talk to you about but after the next question so I'm gonna ask you a question first and then I'll get back to that question of does this prove that P equals NPC first let's take a look at this question so this is about these reductions imagine I have some problems with some reductions between them what can I now derive which of these deductions are true. I'll give you 2 minutes 50 seconds in Feedback Fruits to answer these.
All right, so let's take a look. Uh, again, they nicely add up to 100, so still not sure how to parse this. But answer A was at least selected quite a lot. So let's take a look at answer A first. Um, let's see. If A, B is in NPC, then A is reducible to B and B is reducible to A. Well, that is indeed correct. Why? Well, if A is in NPC, then A is in NP. And if B is in NPC, then B is NP hard. Now, if A is in NP and B is NP hard, then A must be reducible to B. And of course, the reverse also holds. B is in NP, A is NP hard, so B must be reducible to A. So the first answer is indeed correct. What about answer B then? If A, B is in P, if A and B are both in P, then A is reducible to B and B is reducible to A. Now this is not correct. This is false. And why is that? Well, because amongst potentially others, I don't know, but at least there are two problems that are both in P that are not reducible to each other. And they are the problems sigma star and the empty set. You might think, wait, are they problems? Well, they are. The empty set is the problem with no yes instances. The only correct answer is no for every instance. And well, there's a very efficient algorithm to determine that, right? It just says return false. Sigma star is the problem with only yes instances. And again, there's a very easy solution. It's just return true. An example of this, we showed you in an intermezzo in reasoning and logic one and a half years ago, when we talked about computer-aided proofs and colorability. We told you then, and I can totally understand that you have long since forgotten, but we told you about planar graphs, basically uh, coloring book pictures, if you will, and how you can color them with different colors so that no two areas touching each other have the same color. Well, for any coloring book picture, any planar graph, we can color this with four colors. So if you ask me, okay, here's a graph, um, can I call, here's a planar graph or here's a coloring book picture, can I color it with four colors so that two areas that touch have different colors? I can just say yes. You might ask me how, that's a little bit more tricky maybe, but the answer to the decision problem is just yes. It is a problem with only yes instances. Now think about these problems, sigma star and the empty set. How would I reduce these to each other? Because a reduction requires that a yes instance in one problem is mapped to a yes instance in the other. But sigma star has only yes instances and the empty set has no yes instances. So I cannot map a yes instance from sigma star to a yes instance in the empty set because the empty set has no yes instances. So such a reduction cannot exist. So we have a counterexample here. We have two problems, both in P, that cannot be reduced to each other. So answer B is false. Answer C, if A is, small, is reducible to B for a problem B in NPC, then A is NPC. Again, this is false. Why is that? Well, remember, NP is downwards closed, so this would show that A is in NP, but NPC is not downwards closed. This is not enough to show that, N is NP, or that A is NP complete. It shows that A is in NP, but to show it's NP complete, we also need to show that A is NP hard, and for that, we would need a reduction the other way around. Finally, answer D. If A is reducible to B for a problem B in NP, and A is NP hard, then B is NP complete. Now, let's see. Um, what does this say? It says that we found a reduction from A to B. A is NP hard. That would mean B is also NP hard. We know already that B is also in NP. So this indeed shows that B is NP complete. So the correct answers here are A and D. All right, let's see if there are any questions uh, here. 
Uh, okay, apparently the timer in feedback fruits is not visible. Thanks for that. I'll make sure to show a timer on stream uh, for the next questions then. Um, if two problems are reducible to each other, are they both equivalent? Well, so they have the same level of difficulty, you could say, right? One is not harder than the other, and the other is not harder than the one. So they have the same level of difficulty. So in that sense, I guess you could you could say equivalent. It's not notation I'd use, but um, yeah, I suppose so, uh, SH. Or SH, I should say in English. Uh, does it not count as a reduction of some sort if you make a TM that determines a problem and then rejects if that instance accepts and accepts otherwise? Uh, yeah, so uh, our TA61 away uh, is giving a, a good answer here. Um, so what you're doing is you're giving us a Turing machine that can make the reduction. That's nice. Um, but this is not sufficient for a car production. So a car production has this additional constraint of saying polynomial time. And that's very uh, crucial. Um, if you make a Turing machine that is in polynomial time, maps yes to yes and no to no, uh, then um, we would have a, a car production. Apparently, feedback fruit is telling you weird things. Well, currently, I'm not asking you a question, so let's see what happens when I do. Uh, but thanks for uh, letting me know, uh, Decker and the Mondo. Question about option D. Why is it that concluding that A is in NPC, we know for sure that B is in NPC? Uh, why is it that concluding that A is in NPC, we know that B is in NPC? Oh, sorry, sorry. There's just a typo in my answer here. Um, ah, interesting. Okay, so what I say in my answer is also correct, but doesn't actually uh, answer the question asked. So if we have this reduction from A to B, where B is in NP and A is NP hard, um, then we can now know two things. First, we can let's go at, look at my answer. So we know that because A is reducible to B and NP is downwards closed, A must also be in NP. We know that A is in NP hard already, this was given, so A must be NP complete. The question, however, was about problem B. What do we know for that one? Well, we know B is in NP and an NP hard problem is reducible to our problem B, meaning that B must also be NP hard. It already was in NP, so B must also be NP complete. So from answer D, from this first part of our if statement, we can conclude both that A is in NPC as well as that B is in NPC. Does that make sense, Wacker? While I look at a question by SH, why is NP hard not a subset of NP? Is it because of NP hard problems not necessarily having a polynomial time verifiability? That is exactly it, SH. Yes. Yes. So, for instance, even the halting problem is NP hard. But that problem is not even decidable, let alone that we can verify a solution in NP uh, in polynomial time. So, uh, that is exactly the distinction. NP hard um, is not a subset of NP because a problem can be NP hard that is not polynomial time verifiable. Yes. Does that make sense, uh, SH? Good, all right. Then there is one more thing that we should quickly talk about, which is that picture that I showed you at the start. So on the right here, it says that when P equals NP, it also follows that P is NP complete. Or well, they say approximately, so perhaps that is their excuse. But I'd like to make sure that we can rid of this notion fully. Because as we have just seen, there are two problems in P the empty set and sigma star, that do not reduce to one another. So even when p equals np, p can never equal np complete, because problems that are np complete must be reducible to each other. And we know that p has two problems that cannot be reduced to one another, meaning that it is impossible for p to equal np complete, regardless of whether p equals np or not. I hope that answers your question from earlier also, uh, Lighting. 
Uh, Jonathan asks, can a problem be not in MP hard and also not in MP? Ooh, that is a very good question. Um, let me think. I'm not sure I have uh, none come to mind. So that's not saying it's impossible, uh, but I don't know of any. Let me just put it like that. It's an interesting question, but I, I'm afraid I don't have the answer for you. All right, that gives us five more minutes before the break, which is excellent because then I can introduce one more thing to you. We are going to talk about the first NP complete problem, the original as it were. Now, why do we need one? Well, to show that a problem is NP hard, I need to show that all problems in NP are reducible to it. But how can I do that, right? I mean, that, that sounds like a Herculean task. How would I ever be able to show that any problem in NP, even ones that we may not have thought of yet, are reducible to a problem, to show that that problem is NP hard. Well, fortunately, two very clever people, Stephen Cook and Leonid Levin, both discovered this independently in the Cold War, one in the US and one in the USSR. Um, they looked at a problem called SAT, or satisfiability, and they both showed that this problem is NP hard. How did they do that? Well, they said, Take a non-deterministic Turing machine that runs in polynomial time. Then I can do this very clever trick, and I'm uh, on purpose leaving this vague. Uh, I can do this very clever trick to say, look, this is actually just a SAT instance, an instance of this problem satisfiability. And this problem is a yes instance if and only if this non-deterministic Turing machine accepts a word or not. And, and well, only, it's only satisfiable if the non-deterministic Turing machine accepts the word. This is a very clever proof. You can find it in SIPSER if you are interested. In complexity theory, we often recommend it as some bedtime reading because you'll be sure to... Uh, it, it makes sense to read it in bed. Let's put it like that because that's the place where you want to end up. Uh, it's not part of the exam material. All you should know is that SAT is an NP-complete problem or an NP-hard problem, and in a moment we'll show it's NP-complete. So what is this problem SAT? Um, well, given a set of propositional literals and a set of classes, I wonder, is there a way to make these classes true? This is just reasoning and logic. I'm giving you a proposition in disjunctive normal form. I have, uh, is it dis disjunctive? Conjunctive, I always forget. It's um, disjunction of literals, so it's a product of sums. It's conjunctive normal form, sure, whichever works. I have a bunch of uh, variables that I OR together, right? Disjunctions OR, and all of those I want to make true. So example, Let's say I have four propositions, U, X, Y, and Z, and I have four classes. The first one you should read as U or X or, oh, the or symbol dropped out. Okay, excellent. U or X or not Z. And now my question is, is there a way to make this uh, true? So is there a truth assignment to these literals, U, X, Y, and Z? to make all the clauses true. I have this question in Feedback Fruits as well. Feedback Fruits crashed on me, excellent. So perhaps Feedback Fruits 2.0 is not ready for this yet. I see all of you online here. Can I somehow get back? Resume with, yes, yes, please resume. Start next. Okay, there we go. So one and a half minutes to let me know. Um, can we make all of these clauses true? Can we assign true and false to U, X, Y, and Z in such a way that we make all the clauses true?
Okay, let's see. Uh, overwhelming majority for yes. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I agree. Consider, for example, the following. We make u and x true and y and z false. What happens? Well, in the first clause, we happen to make all of them true. Great, we only needed one, but we made all of them true anyway. In the second, not y has become true. In the third, not z. And in the last one, not y and not z. So in every clause, at least one thing is true. And therefore, this is indeed a yes instance of the satisfiability problem. Now, just before I send you into the break, there is also a more restricted version of this. It is called free satisfiability or free SAT for short. It's exactly the same as SAT, um, except that every class has exactly three literals in it. So actually the previous example I showed is already an example of free SAT because every class has exactly three literals. If in regular SAT, this one could have eight and this one could have only two. Uh, but free sat, every class is exactly free, and the question is exactly the same. Now, this problem is also NP-hard. I'm not going to prove that to you, but again, there is a nice proof for this in the book if you're interested. And this problem is also in NP. So that means it is also NP-complete. Why is it in NP? Well, if you give me one of these truth assignments, like the one I just created, right? Make these two false, these two true. Um, then for every literal we need to check, has it been assigned a value? That takes OU time. And for every class we need to check whether it's been made true. That takes OC time, not OU. Let me make more notes of things to fix. Sorry for that. Regardless, it takes some polynomial amount of time. So with SAT and with 3SAT, we have our first two examples of NP-complete problems. I'm going to send you off into a break. After the break, we are going to take uh, a look at some new problems and show that they are also NP-complete by constructing reductions from 3SAT to the new problem. If you want something nice to do during the break, think about 2SAT. 2SAT is actually a problem in P. And perhaps you can find an algorithm to show that, although you don't have to be able to do so for this course. It's fun to think about regardless. I'll see you in about 15 minutes.
Eight. Welcome back, everyone. So let's get started again. So just now before the break, I told you that two very clever people by the names of Cook and Levin helped us out by finding a first problem called satisfiability and by extension free satisfiability that is NP hard. We took a quick look at how we could verify a solution in polynomial time. It would require only linear time in the number of literals and some linear time in the number of classes. So that's both polynomial, meaning it's also in NP. And if it's NP hard and also in NP, it must be NP complete. So satisfiability and free satisfiability are first, our first two examples of problems in NPC. Now let's see if we can make that collection a little bit bigger. Let's take a look at a problem we already discussed last week called a vertex cover. Reminder, we have a graph and we're looking for a subset of nodes of at most a certain size k, such that all of the edges have at least one endpoint in this cover. So for our little example here, if we have the set B, C, D, and E, all four of them, we would have a vertex cover of size four because it covers all of the edges in the graph. There is a smaller possibility by, for instance, taking only B, C, and D. Then we have a cover of size three that once again covers all of the edges of the graph. That is the vertex cover problem. Now, what I would like to do is I would like to show that this problem is NP-complete. My question is, for that, what do I need to do? This time, Feedback Fruits did not think I went offline, so that's good. And you should have about two minutes to give me an answer in Feedback Fruits. All right, let's see. Answer B is very, very popular. And we have some spread over the other options. So let's take a look. What do our answers tell us? Answer A, construct a reduction from free sat to vertex cover. So from an NP-complete problem free sat to our vertex cover problem, uh, that is the new problem we want to look at. What would that show? Well, it would show that 
free sat, uh, sorry, that vertex cover is NP hard because, ver because free sat is NP complete and therefore NP hard. And a reduction from an NP hard problem to a new problem makes that new problem also NP hard. So this would show that vertex cover is NP hard. Well, that sounds useful because that's half of the things we need to prove. The other half is that we need to show that vertex cover is in NP. Well, let's take a look at answer B. If we find this reduction the other way around from vertex cover to free sat, well, free sat is NP complete, therefore it is in NP. NP is downwards closed, therefore vertex cover would be in NP. So this would be a way to show vertex cover is in NP. So combine answers A and B and you're done. You have indeed shown that vertex cover is NP complete. However, doing both A and B is a lot of work. So what we often choose to do is we do answer A, we make a reduction from a known NP complete problem, in this case Frisat, to our new problem, in this case vertex cover, to show our new problem is NP hard. But to show that it is in NP, we just use answer C or answer D. So in fact, these are the questions you dream of on exams where there are no wrong answers. We can use answer B, C or D to show that vertex cover is in NP by downwards closeness for answer B, by definition for answer C, and D is just very vague, but yeah, that is what we would have to show. So uh, answer A to show that vertex cover is NP hard, and one of answer B, C, and D to show that uh, vertex cover is in NP. And combine that, and we've shown that vertex cover is NP complete. Does that make sense? Are there questions about that? I see nothing pop up yet, but I'll give you a couple more seconds here to see if you have any. does not look like it. So let's move on. Let's see if we can actually show it then. So let's start with the easy part. And this is something you should be able to do uh, on an exam as well. Given a problem, you should be able to show the problem is in NP. How do we do that? Well, we do that by saying, by showing that if you give us a solution to the problem, we can verify the solution in polynomial time. In fact, as some of you may know, I'm also teaching algorithms and data structures to mathematicians this quarter. I'm teaching them about P, NP, and NP completeness as well, because I think it should easily fit in a course on ADS. And together with them, I have done this in a bit of Python. So given a graph and given an integer k and given a solution, we can check is this solution correct? So is it of at most size k? Does it cover all the edges? And does it contain only nodes that are actually in the graph? The last one is a very nasty requirement that we often tend to ignore because we can assume that the solution is at least a subset of nodes, right? But definitely the first two checks, is it the right size and does it cover all the edges, it are two important checks. And clearly this is polynomial time, right? The first one is just constant time, this is linear in the number of edges, and this is linear in the number of nodes. So that all seems fine. Uh, this might be quadratic because I chose to put it in a list. Okay, who cares? It's polynomial time. That's also something I want to, to stress for you. When we ask you to give um, or to show that a problem is in NP, don't make life more difficult for yourself. Sure, I could optimize this code maybe by using more sets instead of lists. And maybe if I use hash maps or AVL trees or whatever else, it can be a little bit more efficient. I don't care. To show something is in NP, 
all I need is a polynomial time verification. Whether that is n to the fifth or n or log n, I don't care. Polynomial time is good enough. So don't make life harder on yourselves by trying to find the most optimal way to do it. Just to show something in this NMP, any polynomial verification will do. All right, so that's the first half. For our new problem vertex cover, I had to show two things. I had to show it was in NP that I've done. Now I need to show it's NP hard. And for that, we are going to get, we are going to create a reduction from FreeSat. Now these reductions, you will not have to create yourselves on an exam. Instead, when I give you a reduction, you should be able to apply it to an instance. When I give you the proof that the reduction is correct, you should be able to analyze this proof and critique it. We will see examples of that later. And you should be able to show that the reduction is polynomial time. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna show you a reduction. It's not a trivial one. Uh, as many of these reductions uh, are, they're usually pretty uh, pretty tough, um, which is again why you don't have to be able to create them yourselves. Uh, but we are going to practice applying them on instances and critiquing the proofs. So without further ado, let's take a look. I say that, but there is a little bit more further ado. Because how do I want to do this? Well, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds or 30 seconds in a moment to all get a piece of paper on that piece of paper to write down a FreeSat instance. I, I suggest keeping it manageable. You can go all out, of course, and have 20 literals and 58 classes. If you want to go ahead, but you won't manage in the short time I'm gonna give you. So write down a FreeSat instance and then get ready to follow the instructions of the reduction to see how we are going to transform your FreeSat instance into a vertex cover instance. Now I will also be doing this so there will be an example available to you that I will be drawing, but this works a lot better if you are trying to create one for yourself as well. So 30 seconds, try and find yourselves a piece of paper. I hope you have one in front of you already because you're taking notes, but if not, then find one now and draw a free sub instance or write down a free sub instance on it. Right, so in the meantime, I have done the same. Here it is. I should be able to, yes, do this. I don't know what the red borders mean, but we'll just ignore them. And I hope you've all written down a free sub instance of your own as well. You have some literals, in my case, X, Y, and Z, and you have some classes, in my case, X or not Y or not Z, and Y or Z or X. Okay. Let's apply a reduction. So what are we going to do? Well, we're gonna take our instance, which contains literals and classes, and we're going to construct a vertex cover instance, which requires vertices, edges, and some integer k. And this is an example of a hard reduction. Why is that? Because we're transferring domain, as we call it. We're going from the domain of logic to the domain of graphs. And these reductions are usually quite a bit of work. That's why we're starting with this one, when hopefully you are still a little bit fresh. After the next break, we will do one more where we stay inside the graph domain, and you'll see that that one is quite a bit easier. Okay, let's get started. Step one, for every literal, create two nodes. You can call them U and not U if your literal is called U. 
and you put an edge between them. So take a moment to do this. I will be doing the same. For every literal, we are going to create two nodes. We call them x not x, y not y, z not z, and we put an edge between them. Okay, so far so good, I hope. Um, lighting, you're asking a good question. Is vertex cover always in undirected graphs? Yes, there might be a variant in directed graphs, uh, but the one we study is in undirected graphs. Yes. Okay, that was step one. On to step two. Oh, that's a lot more text. Let's see. For every clause, okay, it was three sets. So yes, a clause consists of three things. Okay, add three nodes and connect them to each other. Okay, let's see. We have three nodes for my first class that I will connect to each other and three nodes for my second class that I will connect to each other. Okay. Yes. I think this should be it. Okay, we, we are talking here about giving them nice names. Um, I could if I want to, so I could call this one, uh, maybe it represents the first class, first literal, first class, second literal, first class, third literal. And this one is second class, first literal, second class, second, second class, third. Okay. And we are being sent into an ad again, but we can stop that. There we go. All right. That was step two. On to step three. Connect the nodes. Thank you. I hate this application. I tried to just buy it and make sure the ads would stop showing up, but it told me that buying it was only an option if i want to to pay a monthly thing for i don't know how long so not an option unfortunately sorry for that step three connect the nodes in classes with the corresponding literal nodes add an edge if it represents a certain literal okay so the first thing in my first class is this x so i need to connect c11 with x and the second thing oh the second thing here represents not y so i need to connect this to not y and this thing represents not z second class first thing is y second thing is z third thing is x well would you look at that we have constructed an amazingly beautiful horrible graph Are we done? Well, let's find out. Ah, no, of course not. Why not? Well, our vertex cover instance has three things, vertices, edges, and also this integer k. So we also still need a value k. It's two times the number of classes plus the number of literals. Two times two plus three is seven. Okay, there we go. A first or a reduction applied to an instance. And you should all have your own instance to which you applied this reduction as well. Now, we need to show that this reduction worked, meaning that a yes instance of um, FreeSAT has become a yes instance of vertex cover, and a no instance of FreeSAT has become a no instance of vertex score. So take a moment, I'll give you two minutes, well, one and a half minutes to do so. Check if your instance is still of the same kind. So if it was a yes instance before, it should now still be a yes instance. If it was a no instance, it should still be a no instance. Uh, this is where I planned to have the break, but as you can see, that did not work out at all. 
uh, which is totally fine. I was planning to have time left at the end. That is just gone now, but uh, I'll give you one and a half minutes to check your work to see if your instance has been properly transformed. All right, so in the meantime, I also checked my own. Uh, this was a yes instance of uh, FreeSAT. I was able to come up with uh, a way to make all the classes true. And the resulted uh, thing is also a yes instance of vertex cover. I was able to construct the vertex cover of size seven exactly that covers all the edges. So I hope that you were able to uh, show this for your instance as well. Okay, let's see if we can prove this in general, right? Now we have one example for which it worked and hopefully with all of yours, there, is, uh, there are more examples. Um, but uh, let's see if we can prove it in general. Now Quirky, you're asking, is there an efficient way to check this? Unfortunately not, right? Determining whether this thing is a yes instance or not is solving an NP complete problem. Or well, we're proving right now that this is an NP complete problem. So the only way to do it is, well, the best way we've got is to try all the options. Uh, so no, there is no efficient way to, to check this. It requires you to solve an NP complete problem. Okay, let's take a look at the proof. What do we need to show? Well, we need to show two things. First, we need to show that indeed, yes instance remained yes and no remained no. We're gonna do that by taking the contrapositive of that second thing. So yes remains yes. And if we have a yes, it must have come from a yes. Uh, and we're gonna show the polynomiality of the reduction, right? We can compute this, these steps in polynomial time. Now, uh, SH is already asking why was K chosen to be that particular formula? Because if I choose another value, it will likely break, is the annoying answer to this. Uh, so these are not questions you need to be able to answer for this course, right? The reduction works with this value for K as to how you were able to construct this reduction. Well, that's a very creative process that often requires a lot of trial and error and falls outside of the scope of this course. So for this course, when we give you a reduction, you need to be able to apply it as we have just done. Uh, and indeed, uh, lighting, if you uh, find a vertex over of size k uh, or smaller, then this uh, thing is a yes instance. So, yes, satisfiable, sure. Now, let's start with one observation that you may have come across when you were trying this for, for yourselves just now. In the graph that we constructed, in order for a vertex cover in this graph to exist, how many vertices must be in that vertex cover at least? Must there be at least four, at least u, at least c, or at least u plus two c? This question is available in feedback fruits 
Can I still? No, okay. Now. Okay, a couple more questions before the question also closes in feedback fruits. And let's see. Good. Overwhelming majority for answer D here. Uh, and B is somewhat popular as well. So let's quickly start with B because B is also part of our answer to D if, you, uh, if that makes sense. Um, what we have constructed here to start with is a bunch of these pairs of notes with an edge between them. In order to cover these edges, we need to pick at least this one or this one in our vertex score. That's the only way we can cover these edges. How many of these edges are there? Well, one for every literal, so indeed U, or size of U, I should say. Now, what about these triangles that represent our classes? They are also, they also have three edges. And in order to cover all three of them, I need to pick at least two of the nodes in these triangles. So that means that in total, I need at least U to cover all of these edges and at least 2C to cover all of these triangles. Which means that any vertex cover of this graph needs to have at least u plus 2c vertices in it. And that is also exactly the value of k, right? So that's interesting. And that's something we can use in our proof. So our proof, remember, we need to show two things. Yes instance remains yes instance. And if we have a yes instance of vertex cover, it must have come from a yes instance in FreeSat. Let's start with the first one. Assume that we had a yes instance of FreeSat. Now prove that the result must also be a yes instance of vertex cover. How does that work? Well, if it's a yes instance of FreeSat, there must be some truth assignment that satisfies the clauses. What are we going to do? And for this, I will update my picture. Let's see. So I have a truth assignment here. And now we're going to construct our vertex cover. What do we do? Well, we take all of the proposition, proposition that should read, all of the proposition nodes that are made true in uh, the tautology. So, or in the truth assignment. So when x we made true, y we made false, and z we made false. What else do we include? Now, for every clause, I know 
that at least, at least one of the three things must have been made true. What I want is to include the other two in my vertex cover. So if we take a look over here at this class, x not y not z, uh, sorry, that's not a great example. Let's start with the other one first, x, y, z. x is made true, the other two are not. So in here, I include the two that are not made true. So see the one representing y and the one representing z. For my other class, well, actually all of them are made true, so it doesn't matter. I can pick two. I'll pick this one and I'll pick this one. And now I claim that these nodes form a vertex cover. Why is that? Well, we can verify it again for my example, but in general, what do I know? Well, by picking one of each of these, I have at least covered all of the literal edges or the proposition edges. I have also covered all of the clause edges, these triangles. By picking two out of three, I am guaranteed to always cover all of these. And, well, all of the edges from propositions to classes must also be covered. How do I know? Well, for every class, one of them was made true, meaning that edge is already covered by picking that literal node. The other two are the ones that I selected in my triangle. So if nothing else, they cover these edges. And the same over here, this one is made true and the others are covered by this, by this, uh, the ones I picked in my triangle. Now in this case, they are also here we go. They are also covered by the fact that these literals are also true because all of them are true. But for the one we did not pick, it's made true, or the, the edge is covered by the fact that we chose the literal, and the other two are covered by the fact that we chose them in our triangle. So Given a truth assignment that satisfies the classes, I can indeed construct a vertex cover of exactly the right size, and therefore this thing must be a yes instance. Now again, such a proof you do not need to be able to construct. But if we give you one of these proofs, you should be able to check it. And what does that mean? Well, we'll see an example of a faulty proof later on, or rather a faulty reduction. Um, but uh, for these faulty reductions, you should be able to come up with a counterexample proving them false, basically. And again, in your homework and later on today, we'll be do some, doing some practicing with that. Okay, that was the proof in one direction. So given a yes instance of FreeSAT, we constructed a yes instance of vertex cover. Are there questions about this one? I refill my water here. Does not look like it. Good. Then let's do the proof uh, in the other way. Yes, so Alex, exactly. Do you also have to prove that no instances work? Yes, so we do. But that's usually pretty hard because for a no instance, what do we know? Well, we know there is no truth assignment and now we need to show that something else also does not exist. And that's not great. So what we do there is we prove the contrapositive. We show that um, if we have a yes instance of uh, if we've constructed a yes instance of vertex cover, so if our reduction results in a yes instance, it must have come from a yes instance of FreeSAT. And remember, Jonathan, we're doing all of this to show that there is that the reduction that I that we constructed from FreeSAT to vertex cover is valid, and that would show that vertex cover is NP hard. Combine that with the fact that we know vertex cover is in NP, 
and we will have shown vertex cover is MP complete. So this is really a sub 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 stop step in showing that indeed vertex cover is NP complete. Okay, let's quickly do the proof the other way around. We have uh, constructed a yes instance. Now we need to show it came from a yes instance of FreeSat. Well, if this is a yes instance, then there must be a vertex cover um, for this thing we constructed. We also know that a vertex cover cannot be smaller than uh, this size K. That's what we observed earlier. So the vertex over must be of at least, of, of exactly size k, right? It must be at most size k and at least size k, so it must be size k. We also, from our observations, derive that the only way we can make this work is by picking exactly one of the nodes uh, of each of these pairs and two of the nodes in these clauses. Now, because it is a vertex cover, um, or, okay, and so the nodes that I pick in the uh, literal pairs, these are the ones I make true, right? So in this case, if I pick Y and not Y, or if I pick not Y out of these two, then I make Y false in the truth assignment I'm constructing. Now, due to the way that the graph is constructed, I know that for every one of these classes, at least one of these edges that leaves the class triangle and goes to these proposition pairs must be covered by one of these proposition nodes. How do I know? Well, I have a vertex cover and only two of these are in it. So the one that's not in it, its edge going to one of these propositional nodes must be covered by that propositional node. And so that shows that every class has a literal which makes it true. And so the original must have been a yes instance. Um, SH, you are also asking a good question, right? Since many to one assignments are allowed, can we not just pick one yes instance and map all the yes instance of FreeSAT to that one particular yes instance of vertex cover? Unfortunately, we cannot. And we cannot because that requires a reduction to know whether we are mapping a yes instance or a no instance. And that is one of the mistakes that we will discuss later. Uh, the reduction cannot know whether it is mapping a yes instance or a no instance. All it knows is it's mapping an instance. Could be a yes instance, could be a no instance. And it cannot know which is this mapping because that would require solving an NP hard problem. Does that make sense, SH? Uh, Wacker, the last step went a bit too fast. Can I repeat the last bullet? Yes, for sure. So remember earlier we observed that a vertex cover must always include two out of three nodes of these triangles uh, and one of these. Well, we also know that because that is exactly the value for K, um, it must have exactly picked two of these and one of each of these literal nodes. So it must also not have picked one of the nodes in the triangle. That thing still has a connection to one of these propositional nodes. So in order for our vertex cover to be a valid vertex cover, this edge from the not picked node to a propositional node must be covered by the propositional node. And since that is exactly a propositional node, I will then put in my truth assignment. That means this clause must be made true by the truth assignment. Does that make more sense, Wacker? If not, we can go over it again uh, during the break, which is coming up shortly. Good, all right. Then there's one last final step to do. So now we have shown that the reduction maps yes to yes, and if it is yes, it must have come from yes. We have shown the reduction is sound. We also need to show that the reduction is polynomial time. Well, that's usually the easy part. Um, and that's again why this is something you should be able to do. So given a reduction, you need to be able to show its polynomial time. Well, here we go. The first thing does something for every literal. So that's OU. The second does something for every class. That's OC. 
the last does something for every class and every literal. So, well, we can probably optimize this in some way. I don't care. It's C times U at worst, right? For every class, something with every literal, sure. And then I need to compute a value for K. That also takes polynomial time. In fact, it only takes logarithmic time. Why logarithmic? Well, remember, K is a number that we represent in binary or decimal or whatever we want. Uh, but C and U are sets, so they are printed as separate elements on our tape of our Turing machine. So in order to determine the size and uh, do computations with the size, um, or sorry, the size is only log C bits. So if I have C objects, the size requires only log C bits. So this value K will require log C plus log U work to compute. Regardless, it requires polynomial time, right? Um, so the reduction is polynomial in the size of the input. Uh, Matej, I see your question, but I'll answer it during the break, if that's okay. Um, so now we're, we've done it. We have shown our problem vertex cover to be in NP. We did that all the way at the start with a bit of Python code. Then we created a reduction from an NP hard problem, FreeSAT, to vertex cover. We've shown this reduction to be sound and polynomial time, meaning that vertex cover is also NP hard. Combine these two facts and we have shown that vertex cover is NP-complete. Now, during the break, if you want, you can give the following a go. It's a problem called clique. Clique is uh, the question given a graph and an integer. Is there a subset of nodes so that every node in this subset is connected to every other node in this subset? This problem is also NP-complete. Um, we can show that it's in NP relatively easily. There is a reduction from vertex cover. Uh, you can read it during the break and try it out if you want. Uh, and if you do both of these, so if you show this reduction to be correct, and if you show that it's in NP, then we can show the problem clique is also NP-complete. All right. With this, I'm going to send us into the next break. After the break, we're going to take a look. We're going to have a short intermezzo again, in which we take a look at a textbook that also thinks it knows what NP-completeness is about, but actually it turns out it doesn't really. Uh, and we're going to take a look at one more of these reductions um, where we stay within the same domain. We go from a graph problem to another graph problem. And with that, I'll see you in a bit. I'll be around in chat if you have any questions. See you soon.
All right. So for the last time for this course, welcome back. Just now before the break, we looked at a vertex cover and after a lot of work, we were able to show that vertex cover is also NP complete. The NP part was easy, showing it was NP hard required, going through a reduction, checking that the reduction was correct, checking its proof, uh, seeing that it all made sense. Okay, I want to do that once more for a new problem, but first, a short intermezzo. Now, you may recall in your first year that I find grading a lot of fun, especially when it comes to finding some interesting answers. Well, this is not limited to just your exams. Case Wittefein and I uh, also take great pleasure in uh, going through textbooks that claim to know something about P, NP, and NP completeness and all this kind of stuff, just to see whether they are right or not. So this is from a book called Modern Compiler Construction from 2002. Quite a popular book, used a lot back then, uh, and even now uh, newer iterations of it are still used quite a bit. But the version from 2002 talked a little bit about NP complete problems. I've put their uh, statements about it on the slide here, and I'm gonna give you two and a half minutes to see if you can spot everything that is wrong with these uh, statements. Uh, spoiler warning, I'll be finding about three mistakes in them. Let's see if you can find them too. about half a minute left for those of you who think they found some mistakes please do share them with me in chat then they should be there by about the time uh, by the moment that the time's up So let's see what mistakes you found. So let's start with Alex here. Uh, step three is wrong because the statement refers to NP and not to NP complete. Yeah, especially the first part, right? So the first part, there's a large class of problems which nobody knows how to solve in less than exponential time, but for which verifying a given solution can be done in less than exponential time, in so-called polynomial time. This is a description of NP minus P, right? Um, and that's not the same as NP complete because they, they go on to say, well, all of them are equivalent, but that's not true. NP minus P is not necessarily the same as NP complete. 
Um, so already mistakes start occurring there. Yes, well done, Alex. Uh, let's see. I see some people that are um, complaining about the last step. That's good. I'll get to that in a second. Jonathan, the first one is wrong because less than exponential time is not strong enough. It has to be polynomial. Um, I wonder about that. So I wonder if there is a polynomial or a non-polynomial thing that is also not exponential. So is there something in between polynomial and, exp and exponential? I think there is not. So I think a less than exponential um, could be the same as polynomial, at least for the purposes here. So I'm not sure that is uh, something I would call a mistake. Um, let's see then. So there's some uh, people uh, about number four. So quirky, if it is an NPC, it must also be an NP, and therefore its solutions can be verified in polynomial time. Um, and that's also what um, lighting is saying. Uh, and indeed also Matei. So yes, you're all right. So this, this last remark is just complete nonsense, right? Problems in NPC are still in NP. So that means their solutions can be verified in polynomial time. So the last statement just makes no sense at all. Um, Lighting also says a problem that reduces to NPC is not necessarily NPC. So that's also true, right? So they say that here, any problem that can be solved by using an NP-complete problem without introducing an extra exponential time dependency is also called NP-complete. That's also incorrect. Remember, something in NPC is also NP-hard, meaning anything in NP can be reduced to it. But anything in NP, that means also problems in P. I could, for example, take the path problem, for which Dijkstra finds us an efficient solution. I could take the path problem and reduce it to vertex hover. I don't care, why not? And then I could solve my path problem by using an algorithm that solves the vertex hover problem. Now, I don't see why I would want to, because vertex hover is a lot harder than path. So I'm making my problem harder, but I could, and it doesn't make path NP complete. So indeed, that is also a mistake in here. Well done. I put these mistakes uh, in an overview as well, right? So um, the first is about indeed their definition of NPC. Then a problem that can be reduced to an NP-complete problem does not have to be NP-complete. And their last remark is just utter nonsense, utter nonsense. Well done. Now there's many more interesting uh, quotes like this out there. I don't know who of you are familiar with the amazing show on the BBC called the University Challenge. I'm usually very glad if I manage to get two questions right in an episode. Um, and they had a question about P versus NP on there once as well. And the definition they gave was also completely wrong. Um, so yes, this happens a lot out there. And I think it's always a lot of fun to see what they do and criticize that. All right. So far for our intermezzo. Let's talk about Hamiltonian paths and Hamiltonian cycles, named after this guy, Hamilton, who came up with an interesting puzzle. And if you remember reasoning and logic, you will remember that I love puzzles. In this puzzle, we have a number of black boxes and a number of white boxes. And what we need to do is we need to construct a cycle, a loop through all of the white boxes. One big loop. Uh, I've recently come across this thing in another form. I thought it was, I think it was called sliver link then, uh, but it relies on the same principle, the principle of constructing a Hamiltonian cycle. So let's make that a little bit more formal. What is this problem? Well, the problem is given a graph, uh, usually undirected, although a directed version of this problem also exists, uh, but given a graph, let's say undirected, is there a simple cycle that visits all vertices exactly once, except of course for the first vertex. Simple cycle means we're not allowed to repeat edges. So given a graph, can we create a cycle through all of the vertices back to where we started? Now this problem is NPC, it's NP complete. Uh, why is that? Because I tell you to, that it is. Uh, of course, there is a much more formal proof for this, but we're not gonna go into that one. Um, by all means, go and look it up if you want. There's nice reductions, I think, from vertex cover they usually pick to Hamiltonian cycle, although mm, now they might pick another base problem. Okay, regardless, there's many interesting reductions to show this. 
Um, but we are going to just assume that Hamiltonian circuit or Hamiltonian cycle is indeed in NPC. What I want to show is that Hamiltonian path is also in NPC. So what is the difference? Well, Hamiltonian cycle is go through all the vertices back to where you started. Hamiltonian path is just go through all the vertices. Um, and you might think, okay, that, that problem might be a bit easier, right? Because, well, we don't have to make this, this last step. We only need to go find a way through all of them. Well, unfortunately, this problem is still hard. And we can show that by using a reduction. So we are going to have to show two things to show that it is NP complete. First, that it is in NP, meaning given a solution, we can verify it in polynomial time. Well, that is once again the easy part of such a proof. What do we do? Well, if you um, give me a path, or if you give me a, 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 a sequence of vertices, let's say, I can simply check that every vertex of the graph is included in the path, and that for any two consecutive vertices in this list you give me, there is an edge between these vertices. Igdecker, I noticed that you tried to, oh, there were a lot of caps apparently, maybe you tried to write P versus NP. Uh, if you could try again, but without the caps maybe, sorry for this, the bot is sometimes a bit over aggressive. If you have a question, try uh, posting it again. Uh, or maybe one of the mods can tell me what the question was. So first things, Hamiltonian path is in NP. That's the easy part, right? Given a solution, we verify it. We can do this in polynomial time. This is uh, OV and this is OE or something like this. Now the hard part, showing that Hamiltonian path is also in NP hard. Uh, the question was, is ham p equal to ham c? So no, they are two different problems. Uh, thanks, Yoshi, for uh, posting the question again. Uh, they are two different problems. Hamiltonian path just wants a path through all of the vertices. That is not necessarily, that is not a cycle. It's a simple path. And Hamiltonian cycle is a path through all vertices that gets you back to where you started. So that really is a cycle through all vertices. So the questions are very similar, but subtly different. Now, again, we're going to take a look at a reduction um, to show this problem is NP hard. And for that, I'm going to give you one minute to draw a graph, any graph will do, on which we can apply this reduction in a moment. I will be drawing one as well. Right, so I've drawn a graph. I've decided to keep it fairly simple. Here it is, just four vertices with some edges between them. Notice um, that this is a no instance of a Hamiltonian circuit. Right, I cannot make a cycle through all of these and get us back to where we started. With just one extra edge, I can do this. Um, but in the current situation, I cannot. So this time I've gone for a no instance. Okay, let's see. Let's see how this reduction is going to work. Well, I promised you that this reduction was going to be easier because we would be going from a graph to a graph problem instead of before where we went from logic to graph. Well, it is a little bit easier. We only have two steps. First, we're gonna add three new nodes. We'll call them A, B, and C. 
I'll draw them in blue here. A, B, and C. Uh, this is not a nice order to draw them in because of what we're going to do next. So I'm going to cheat by knowing what step two is going to be. I'm going to draw C over there. Now step two, connect B to an arbitrary node. Okay. Um, well, it happens to be above this one. I'll just connect it here. Connect A and C. All right and connect C to all the neighbors of this arbitrary node. Okay, so I connect C to this one and to this one. All the neighbors of uh, this arbitrary node V1 that I picked. Okay. Oh, oh, that was it. Okay, there, there's nothing else. Hmm, only two steps. Um, now what I claim is, um, that this is an instance of Hamiltonian path and it is a yes instance only if the Hamiltonian circuit instance we started with was also a yes instance and the other way around right so if the Hamiltonian circuit instance was a yes instance this must be a yes instance too now again take a moment I'm going to give you one minute to verify that if your original thing was a yes instance then this is still a yes instance and if it was a no instance, then this is still a no instance. Again, we are off for the break time, but that's okay. So I will also take a look at my own. It used to be a no instance. So now it should also not be possible to make a path through all the nodes. Well, being able to show that it's not possible is usually hard, but the thing is going to rely on these. Yes. Okay. All right. So hopefully if you had a yes instance of the Hamiltonian circuit problem, you have been able to also find your Hamiltonian path to prove that your new instance is also a yes instance. I had a no instance, so that's a little bit trickier, right? Remember for no instance, it means to show that something does not exist, which is usually a bit harder because uh, I can't simply construct it. But what I see here is that in the thing I've constructed, I have three of these nodes that have only one outgoing edge. And in order to have a simple path without repeating nodes, well, I could take this one to start with, A, and go to C, maybe I'd go here. But then in order to get to B, I can never leave it. And to get to this node, I can also never leave it again. So there would be two endpoints for my path. So I cannot make that work. So uh, in my original graph, which is just these four nodes, there was no cycle. And also in the new graph, which includes these three new nodes, there is no new path. Um, so Ick Decker, in, uh, the original problem was a Hamiltonian circuit problem. That is, in my case, only the white nodes. And in that, I do not have a Hamiltonian circuit. I only need to consider the ones in white. Uh, and for the Hamiltonian path instance we created, we need to also include the blue ones. So the added nodes only count for the Hamiltonian path problem, the one we are reducing to. Does that make sense? I'm hoping it did while I move on to the next bit. So again, for this reduction, we need to show both that it's sound and that it's polynomial. Soundness, again, is something you should only be able to read and not be able to construct yourself, but polynomiality you should be able to do for yourselves as well. Let's start with soundness then. So, no, you stupid tablet. Okay. 
Um, let's start with soundness. We have um, assumed that we had a yes instance of Hamiltonian circuit. Then I must now have constructed a yes instance of Hamiltonian path. Well, for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat and make my original a yes instance. Um, because now I should be able to show that this thing also has a path. Well, how does that work? Well, if the original was a circuit or was a Hamiltonian cycle, then there must have been a cycle. And because the cycle goes through all nodes, I can just have it end and start in this arbitrarily node chosen node V1. Right? If it goes through all nodes, then I can say, okay, well, the first one it goes through is V1. So that's also the one we end up in at the end. Then that means that if I just leave out the last V1, so in my example, I go from here, this would be a Hamiltonian cycle. If I just leave out this last edge, I have a Hamiltonian path. And that's a Hamiltonian path through all of the original vertices of the graph. Now, because I have not removed any edges in my reduction, this is also a path that contains all of the vertices except A, B, and C in my new graph. So now all I need to do is show I can add A, B, and C to this path to create a Hamiltonian path in the new graph. Well, that, that I can do. Why? Well, B is connected to V1. That's how I chose this V1. And I also know that the node I end up in at the end, this one, the V double prime in the proof, must be connected to um, uh, C. Why is that? Well, because it's a neighbor of V1 and I connected C to all the neighbors of V1. Furthermore, I also know that A is connected to C, so I can just extend my path by saying, okay, start in B, go to V1, now do whatever the original uh, cycle told you to do, except for the last step to get back home. And from that point onwards, do C and A. So now we have constructed from the Hamiltonian cycle in the original graph, a Hamiltonian path in the new graph. Does this part make sense? Given a Hamiltonian cycle in the original graph, I can construct a Hamiltonian path in the new graph. going to give you another 15 seconds to also account for stream delay to see if there's any questions. Okay, uh, one question from uh, Wacker. I've lost a few of the bigger picture here. What's the initial reduction we are doing? So we are trying to show that Hamiltonian path is NP hard by constructing a reduction from Hamiltonian circuit to Hamiltonian path. And for that, we have applied this reduction to an instant of Hamiltonian circuit. And now we're indeed showing that this reduction is sound. So our, our goal is to show that Hamiltonian path is NP hard. Okay. I see no other questions about this first part of the soundness proofs. I hope that cleared it up a little bit, Wacker, um, while I move on to the soundness proofs in the other direction. If the result has a Hamiltonian path, then the original must have had a Hamiltonian cycle. Well, let if this is a yes instance, then there must be some path. Consider that path. Well, what do I know about the path? I know that every node on this path must have a degree of at least two. Degree of two, degree of two. The degree of a vertex was ADS, ADS. Oh yes, the degree of a vertex was the number of edges leaving it. Well, a node on a path must have two edges, uh, must be connected to two edges, one to get into the vertex and another one to get out. 
So every node on the path, except the first and the last one, must have a degree of at least two. I also know that due to the way I constructed my graph, A and B must have uh, a degree of one. So that means they must be the endpoints of my path. So, I, furthermore, I know that these have only one edge, right? So I know also the second and the penultimate, the second and the penultimate uh, node in my path. They must be C for the second one and V1 for the penultimate one, right? So I start in A, I must go to C next. Now I do something else. And at the end, I must end up in V1 and go to B. Now consider that stuff in the middle, that's something else. I've called it pi on the slide. This pi must be a path that contains exactly all of the other nodes in my graph. Why? Well, because pi prime was a Hamiltonian path through all the nodes. We've already covered A, C, V1 and B. So there must still be all the other nodes left to go. Now consider that path, the path pi. The first node on it, right, so where we go from C, must be a neighbor of V1. Hang on. Yes, for some reason OBS is shouting at me that the connection is lost. What's going on here? Okay. We should be back online. Can you confirm? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, no idea what happened there, but my internet had a hiccup. Uh, sorry for that. Let's see. Uh, what were we working? What were we working on? Uh, we were showing that the reduction also works the other way around. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where we lost each other, so I'll reconvene from this third bullet here. The mic should not be muted. I think everybody can hear me, question mark. But let's confirm. No, it's not. Okay, hear sound. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, once again, sorry for that. So. We had discovered that A and B must be the endpoints of our path uh, because they have a degree of one and only the nodes at the end of the path can have a degree of one. That means that the path must start by going from A to C, then doing something else to end up in V1 and then go to B. This something else part, this pi, as we called it, um, must start with a neighbor of C. And the neighbors of C are exactly the nodes that are also neighbors of V1. So it must be possible to go from V1 to this neighbor where our path pi starts. And that means that we can construct a cycle by starting in V1, going to the start of our path, which also ends in V1. So we must be able to construct a simple circuit in the original graph V, uh, in the original nodes V. Uh, Decker, the disconnect should not have interfered with the YouTube recording. OBS says it's still, 
it's still recording. Uh, Matei, good question. What guarantees that we don't use the same edge? Well, from V1, uh, to start with, we go to the first node on our path, pi. Right, so that would that is this node V. That is a node that is a neighbor of C. And we know that the path pi goes through exactly all of the nodes once. So if it starts with V, it goes through all other nodes in the graph, only to end up with a neighbor of V1. All right, that's my third bullet here. Pi must be a path containing all the nodes in V minus V1. So in this case, it must end up over here and then use this edge to get to V1. So pi contains all the nodes my, except for V1 once, and therefore we cannot be using the same edge. Does that make sense? Good, all right. So once again, we've shown the reduction is sound. Now we just need to show it's polynomial. Well, this was our reduction. How much time does it take to do this? Well, uh, adding some nodes would only take constant time, but perhaps if we really want to, we would have to make a full copy of the graph. So that would take OV time. If we want to make a full copy of the edges, it's OE time. Otherwise, constructing these two extra edges is just constant time, but this requires a little more time, right? For every uh, neighbor of V1, we need to do something. Regardless, it can be done in polynomial time. So to recap, once again, what have we done? We've taken a problem, Hamiltonian path, a new problem. We've shown the problem to be in NP first. Then we constructed a reduction from Hamiltonian circuit to Hamiltonian path. Hamiltonian circuit, I keep saying circuit, you can also call it cycle. Hamiltonian cycle or circuit is NP complete, therefore NP hard. Because this reduction was both sound and polynomial time computable, it follows that our problem Hamiltonian path is also uh, NP hard. And if it's both NP hard and NP, it must be NP complete. Uh, Lighting is asking if I know the start and the end node, is it then easy to find a simple path or cycle through all the nodes? In the polynomial time problem. Well, consider Hamiltonian cycle, it must go through all cycles or through all nodes. So changing the question from is there a cycle that goes through all nodes to is there a cycle that goes through all nodes and starts and ends in this one doesn't change the question at all because I could take any vertex and I could have the cycle start and end there if a cycle exists. So no, knowing the start and end node does not make the problem easier. It would still be NP complete. All right. Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is he doing? Okay. You might also be thinking, why does he need that node A? Why can we not just have only B and C? Can we not make the reduction simpler or, or easier with less extra nodes? Um, the answer is no, we really do need this node A. And in the homework for this week, you will show us why. What you will do is you will give us an instance of Hamiltonian circuit that is not mapped correctly. So hint, try and find a no instance of Hamiltonian circuit that you would map to a yes instance of Hamiltonian path is we, if we do not have this extra node A. So this is part of your homework. Solutions will, of course, be available after Tuesday. Make sure to check it out. You can show in that way that this other reduction that we introduced there is invalid. So that's one way that you can show that the reduction is invalid, right? Find an instance for which a no instance maps to a yes instance or the other way around. Sometimes you also encounter reductions like this. Let's say I have a reduction from Hamiltonian path to a new problem. Step one is the same, add three, three new nodes. And now the second step in the reduction says connect B to the first node in the path pi, and then we do some more stuff. Why does this not work? What is wrong with this? Let me transition back here. 
Uh, this is not a feedback fruits question, uh, Pablo. Uh, I don't think I have any more feedback fruit questions today. You can just let me know in chat if you have an answer. I don't say what pi is. Okay, I can tell you. Um, pi is the, the path from the Hamiltonian path instance. All right, so it's a Hamiltonian path instance. So, well, we have uh, some path. That's the path I mean. Ah, exactly lighting. We're reducing Hamiltonian path to another problem. Um, and having pi means that we have a solution to our Hamiltonian path problem. So this reduction only works for yes instances. It only works for instances that have a solution, that have a Hamiltonian path. But that's not the way a reduction is supposed to work. A reduction is supposed to map yes instances to yes instances, but no instances to no instances. So a reduction can never use the solution to a problem. Because the solution may not exist, right, for no instances. So it's indeed also a mapping issue, uh, Matei, although slightly different from how you are describing it. But a reduction cannot use the fact that a solution exists, because a solution might not exist. And even um, if for whatever reason it could do that, then well, the reduction needs to be polynomial time. And how are we going to find the solution in polynomial time? That's only possible for problems in P. And for problems in NP, or NPC rather, uh, we believe it to be impossible unless P equals NP. Does, does this make sense, this, uh, this mistake? It's a, a relatively common mistake. The, especially in in submissions of your colleagues for complexity theory homeworks, um, we see that people try to use the solution to a problem in the reduction, but this really is impossible because a reduction should be agnostic of what type of instance it is. It should work for yes instances and for no instances. All right. Now that was quite a lot and also in two and a half hours. So well done if you uh, stuck around this long, almost reaching the three hour mark or two hours, three quarters uh, mark. Um, I have about six minutes left according to my timer here. Um, so a couple of brief things to wrap this up. First of all, remember I like puzzles. And as it turns out, many of the problems that puzzles are based on like the Sliverlink puzzle that I mentioned before when talking about Hamiltonian cycles, but also like Sudoku, turn out to be NP-complete problems. Sudoku uh, in a more general form, where we say we have a grid of n squared by n squared size, uh, and we have columns, rows, and uh, n by n squares that all need to contain the digits one through n squared, is an NP-complete problem. Verifying a solution is easy, Finding if one exists, and if so, finding it is hard. We have no polynomial time algorithm. If you do, if you find an algorithm that always works in polynomial time, you will have solved that P equals NP problem. Other puzzles, perhaps less conventional puzzles, for example, Tetris, um, is also contains NP hard problems problems that are not easy to solve. And this is what makes these puzzles fun, at least in my opinion. Now, we talked about NP-complete as being the hardest problems in NP. Does that mean they are the hardest problems out there altogether? Is there more than that? Yes, there's lots more than that. Now, the next slide and everything I say about it is not exam material. It's just after two years of teaching you, and this will likely be my last lecture to you, although this is not the way I'd imagined that taking place, me sitting at home talking to my phone and a microphone in hopes that some of you hear me. Alas, that's what we have to settle for. I want to tell you a little bit more, even though I've been trying to do this over the last two weeks, 
about all the other amazing things in complexity theory that make computer science such an interesting field for me. So in this massive diagram, you know now about regular languages. You know about context-free languages. You know about the class P and the class NP. You know about decidable languages and recognizable languages. But just this simple diagram, well, simple for some definition of it, shows us already that there is so much more out there. There is the class of co-NP, problems for which no instances are easy to verify. It's easy to check that there is no solution to a problem. There are problems that are easy to solve with probabilistic algorithms, an algorithm that flips some coins every time it's run. It turns out that problems that require polynomial space instead of polynomial time do not care whether they have non-deterministic space or, non or deterministic space. It's all the same to them. There is no difference there. Of course, there is exponential time and exponential space, which allows us to solve even more problems. From all of this, we are missing the class of quantum, uh, uh, of quantum algorithms, right? Problems that a quantum computer can solve in polynomial time. From this, we are missing stuff like approximation classes, problems for which we can find an approximate solution in polynomial time. And there is so much more there to see, learn and discover. Now, I have some good news on that. The good news is that if you are also very interested in this, then next year we will be offering, I say we, the algorithmics department will be offering an elective course on solving NP hard problems. It's going to be a lot of fun. I probably won't be involved, but I am going to check it out because I too am excited for all the stuff they're going to teach you there. So, after seeing you for many different courses over the last two years, this is the last time that I have been lecturing you. Hopefully, I will still see you around, uh, maybe for your software projects, or maybe for your, well, likely not for your research projects, but perhaps on some other occasion. For now, it was a great pleasure for me to teach you together with Matthijs, about regular languages, context-free languages, decidable and undecidable languages, about P, NP, NP completeness, the ultimate challenge in computer science is P equal to NP. And today, a little bit about car productions and uh, how they work. With that, for this course, there should be only one more thing left for you, hopefully, which is an exam somewhere in quarter four. And as soon as I have more information on that, I will let you know. With that, goodbye for now. If you have any questions now, I'll stick around in chat for a little bit longer. And otherwise, you are more than welcome to post them on the Brightspace forums. See you sometime.